Hey there, I'm Douglas from DraftBit. Today, we're going to be talking about the view component. The view component is the most fundamental building block for creating user interfaces in DraftBit. A view acts as a container that supports layouts using Flexbox, styling options, touch handling, and accessibility controls. It maps directly to the native view component of any platform, whether it's UI view of an iOS, a div on the web, or an Android view. Views can be nested inside other views, allowing for complex and flexible layouts. They can have zero to many children of any type, making them incredibly versatile for designing your application UI. Now, let's jump in to DraftBit and add a view component to our app. First, we go to the left side to our component picker and we click add and then we search for view. Now, let's go ahead and click on our view and then go to styles and then let's add a background color. So by default, it has no background color and for now let's just have a red background color however at first you might notice that the view is invisible this is because the view doesn't automatically expand to fill the space available to it to fix this i'll set the flex property to one so here we'll come here to flex property and then i'll set this to one and this tells the view to take up all the available space within its parent container now the view stretches to fill the entire screen and can now and we can now see the background color we applied and then we might ask what why is it not filling this entire screen and why can we see this white background so if i come back on home you'll notice that i have some padding if i remove this padding then the view should fill the entire screen but then i just need some padding and yeah i think that looks cleaner let's go back to our view and then let's add a button Then let's add a text. And as you can see, our view can hold all these components. Then lastly, let's have an image. Notice how every, there are no spaces in between our components. And, you know, usually we would go to the button, add some margin bottom. But when we have a view, there's something that's called a gap that we can just have. And then we can just have it be 10. And notice how it's going to add spaces in between our components. Right, and now we have spaces in between our components. Then here on our device picker, let's go to web preview. And yeah, I think it's looking good, but I think red is too bright. So let's just change that to a medium color. Yeah, and I think this looks much better. So yeah, let's dive deeper into how Flexbox works, starting with flex direction property. This is the one of the most important aspects of laying out components inside a view. So flex direction by default, flex direction is set to column. So this means just uh, one item on top, one item at the bottom. And you can see with this small diagram that they give you that right now we're in flex column. This means that all components inside the view are arranged vertically from top to bottom. And then we have a line. A line works on the horizontal axis. So from left to right, allowing you to control how items are aligned horizontally within the container. So the beautiful thing about DraftBit, it gives you these small diagrams where you can see that if you want your items aligned on the left, it shows you that this is called flex start, this is called center, and this is called flex end. So right now, they are in the left. And then if we go to the center, you're going to see, right? It now goes on the center. And then if we go to the flex end, it now goes on to the end, right? Let's just have it back to the start. Perfect. Then we have justify. So justify works on the vertical axis. So from top to bottom. So it controls how items are positioned from top to bottom. Uh, so right now it's at the top. So we'll call that flex start, then center, then flex end. So top, center, flex end. Then notice how if I click center, it's going to go to the center. If I click flex end, it's going to go to the bottom. All right, then let's, uh, let's just have that back to normal. Yeah, and this is just the basics, right? We have more features like flick, uh, space in between. So if we have space in between, it's just going to have space in between the get started, the text, and the image. So let's have that space between. And then notice how everything now has a space in between. And then we have space around. So the space around is just like space between, except it has space on the top and space on the bottom, right? So let's just that here. Let's just have everything back to normal. Then let's look at flex direction row. So right now, notice how everything is column. So one, two, three, they are all stacked in a column. So if we want them in a row, 
right? We just come here and we say direction row, right? So it's now left to right. Then let's just give a button a height. Then let's go back to our view. So now notice how the line is now changed, right? So the line now, when it's row, the line is now controlling the vertical axis, top to bottom. So right now this is flex start, center, flex end. So I think you now get the point, right? So we have that in the center and we have justify and then we have gap. So let's just reset everything. And then let's proceed with the view. So up next, let's look at the configurations. So if you come here, the first thing that we see is the component name. So this is the basic configuration option that allows you to rename the component. By default, the name is set to view, as you can see, but you can change it to something like home container or header view. This is especially helpful when you have multiple views in your project, you can easily identify them in the component tree. So imagine we had lots of views in here. It would become complicated if it's view one, view two, view three, it wouldn't make sense. But then if it's like header, and then the next one is like list, then the next one is maybe footer, then, you know, that would make more sense. So that's why you can rename it here. Then up next, we have advanced configurations. These settings give you more control over the view behavior. Uh, before we move on, I want to mention that for some properties, I might not be going into deep demonstrations, you know, just so that the video is not too long. Because if I go into deep demonstrations for all these, the video might become too long. So yeah, let's look at head slope. Head slope allows you to define an invisible padding around the component, expanding the area where the touch interactions are recognized without changing the components of visible size. So basically what we're saying is sometimes you have an element that is very small and think of it like a radio button or, or it's a very, very tiny button and you need to click it on your phone. Sometimes it's too small and you can't click it. So what head slope does, it expands the area that you can click. So look at this image. If we expand the head slope of this image and we want to click it, maybe we'll be able to click it from here, from this point. So if we if we increase the head slope, so basically that's what, that's what that does. Then up next, let's look at the pointer events. So this is an advanced property that allows you to control how a component and its children handle touch interactions. So how do touch interactions work? So right now the everything inside here, the button, the text and the image, they are all inside the view. So if a user comes and clicks, right, uh, the first thing that registers this click is the view. Then the view will pass that click to the button or whatever was trying to be clicked. So if I come here and I click the button, right, you can see the button is responding to the click. But the first thing that handled that click was the view. Then the view passed down that click to the button and then I was able to click it. So here we can control how that behavior works. So the first way is called auto. So this is the default behavior. Both the view and its children are able to receive this touch event. So right now I can come in, I can click the button properly. The view receives it, passes it to the button and again, click. Then next up I have none, right? So none, the view and all its children do not receive the touch event. It essentially makes the component untouchable. So right now if I click on the view, the view doesn't get the touch event. Now, if I click on the button, the button no longer gets the touch event, right? So that's what that does. Then we have box none. So box none, the view itself cannot receive the touch event, but the children can. So we're now bypassing the view and I can now click the button. So the button receives, but the view doesn't. Then we have box only. The view can receive it, but the children cannot. So now the view can receive the touch event, but when I click the button, I can no longer click the button. Uh, let's have it back to normal. Okay, then we have the remove clipped subviews. So this property is used to optimize performance when dealing with scrolling content that is off screen subviews. So when this property is enabled, DraftPay will automatically remove subviews that are off screen from the native hierarchy. So the purpose of this is particularly useful in a scenario where you have a long list of scrollable items. By removing the off screen components, it can help reduce memory usage and improve the performance of your application. So think about this. We have an Instagram feed here. We're showing all these posts and right so maybe we have uh 200 posts we, we don't want to load all these posts at once we just want to load the posts that the user can see so this helps remove the, the ones that the user can't see it removes them and then only shows what the user can see and then when we scroll it starts to show the the ones that come into view basically then we have collapsible so this, this is an important property for 
optimization in DraftBit. When enabled, it allows the view component to be automatically removed from the native hierarchy if it has no children or content inside it. So notice when we first created the view, we were not able to see the background color until we added a flex of one. When we created that view, it had nothing. So we're saying if it's collapsible, uh, DraftBit is going to come in and it's going to hide that view. Just so, you know, for optimization purposes, so we don't just have empty views in our hierarchy. Then up next, we have needs of screen alpha compositing. So this is a property that helps improve how a view is displayed, especially when it has transparency or special effects. So what does it do? When this property is enabled, the system will prepare the view of screen before it appears on your device. This means it creates a complete version of the view, including any transparent areas and makes sure everything looks right. Why is this important? By doing this, the system can handle colors, blending more accurately, ensuring that when you see the view on your screen, it appears sharp, vibrant without any unexpected color mixing or blurriness. It helps maintain the visual quality of the app. Then lastly, we have should rasterize iOS. This, this is a property that can improve how a view is rendered on iOS device. So what does it do? When this property is enabled, the screen is going to take a snapshot of the view. So it will come in, take a snapshot of this view. Then it's going to convert it into a bitmap, bitmap image. Uh, this bitmap image is then used when displaying the view instead of redrawing it every time. So why is this important? This process can speed up the rendering of complex views, making them appear more smooth on the screen. Uh, it's especially useful for views with many layers of effects and it reduces the workload on the processor. Yeah, then up next we have accessibility. So before we move on, what is accessibility? So accessibility refers to the design of products, devices, services, or environments for people with disabilities. So it just means we're designing our application with disabled people in mind. First, we have accessible property. So this property indicates whether the view should be considered accessible to users with disabilities. So when you enable this, you're telling those screen readers, uh, those devices that help people with disabilities that this view uh, is for them. Then we have accessibility level. Uh, this property provides a custom label for the view that overrides the default text read by screen readers. It's used to give a clear and concise description of what the view represents, enhancing the user's understanding of the content. Then up next, we have accessibility hint. This property provides additional context or guidance about what will happen when a user interacts with the view. Then we have accessibility role. This property defines the role of the view for assistive technologies. For example, it can specify if the element is a button, header, or link, which helps screen readers convey the correct information to the user. Then we have accessibility elements hidden. When this is set to true, it hides the accessibility elements within the view. This can be useful for decorative views that should not be read by screen readers, ensuring a cleaner experience for the users. So maybe you have a view that has many, many images or many colors, and maybe you don't want that available for, you know, disabled people. So you just come in here and you can hide that view. And then the screen reader is going to ignore it. Then we have accessibility ignores inverted colors. So what this does, it determines whether the view should ignore color inversion settings on the device. If enabled, colors will colors in the view will remain unchanged even if the user has activated color inversion for better visibility. So yeah, sometimes in the accessibility settings, they want to invert the colors to see better. And if you don't want this to happen in your application, you can in ignore the inverted color settings. And then next up, we have accessibility live region. This property specifies how accessibility services should inform users about changes made to the view. It can indicate whether the changes should be announced immediately or only when the user focuses on the view, helping keep users informed about dynamic changes. So yeah, how is this helpful inside the application? So let's say you have a feed that's updating maybe every few seconds, maybe it's a social media app. Um, Sometimes we don't want the screen reader to keep coming back and reading it every few seconds. We might want it to wait a bit and then yeah, and then come back when we have enough content on the screen. So that controls that. And then lastly, we have important for accessibility. This property indicates the view significance for accessibility purposes. It helps prioritize how accessibility services interact with elements, ensuring that critical components are properly communicated to the user. And then next up, we have interactions. So interactions, we have on layout. The on layout interaction in DraftBit is triggered when the layout of a component has been calculated or updated. This can happen when the component is first rendered, 
or if there are changes that affect its size or position. So how do we know when this runs? So we can come here on layout and we can console log. And then we can just say component run. We close that, then we open our console log and we can see component run. So as soon as the component comes onto the screen, uh, this this console log is then triggered, right? So we can go back to on layout. So instead of, you know, displaying to the console, what we can actually do is we can have an API request here. And whenever it comes onto the screen and this is triggered, the on layout is triggered, we can make a call to the backend and fetch the data. So yeah, we can do many things with this. And yeah, I think that wraps up our exploration of the view component in Draftbit. We've covered how to add it. We've covered how to configure with styles and properties and utilize important features like Flexbox layout, accessibility settings, and interactions. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, please consider subscribing. Your feedback is very essential to us, so please leave a comment. And if there are any specific topics that you want us to cover uh, that you'd like to see in future videos, uh, please write that in the comment. And yeah, thank you for watching and happy building in Draftbit.